Hello and welcome to the first episode of the Reach Alliance podcast, Insight to Impact. I'm your host, Catherine Germay, and today is International Women's Day. Around the world, we celebrate the social, economic, and cultural political achievements of women while promoting gender equality set in a world that is diverse, equitable, and inclusive. So to celebrate this important day, we have two fantastic Reach Alliance researchers with me who have been conducting extensive research examining interventions in Mexico and Nepal, respectively, highlighting the world of women and in these hard-to-reach communities. So it's an honor to welcome to the podcast Margot Roncier and Elena Alnagar. Thank you, Catherine. Glad to be here. Thank you. So... Leila and Marco, could you, you know, since today is the you know, International Women's Day, what are your thoughts on this particular day and how would that relate to your research? Um, I can go. So uh, in the context of reach, I think Women's Day is a very, very important opportunity to reemphasize and bring to the forefront um, the mammoth role that women play in addressing climate change and achieving sustainable development. Yeah, um, to me, like International Women's Day is a day to reflect on the achievements of women across the world um, and also like the progress that we made towards working uh, towards equity for all. I think for both of you, I want to ask, what is your research project about so that we can have a bit of a framework? So as part of our research, we wanted to understand three collectives that were made up of mostly women who had taken it upon themselves to act on the environmental devastation and fight back. And so each collective was located in a different community in the periphery of Guadalajara. The Hariban uh, project was established to emphasize the interconnectedness of people, the forest, and the climate. And a unique thing about this project is that it really stressed the gender equality and social uh, inclusion aspect, which up to that point, we're talking around 2011, I think, uh, was not a huge point that um, development programs in Nepal focused on. So let's actually go to you, Marga. Within the report, one participant said that these initiatives were essentially an act of caregiving at home and on the land was basically like sort of like a you know a political act. Could you tell us a little bit about like what was the ramifications about these eco-feminist initiatives? Yeah, so as members of the collective conduct, uh, conduct more activities, more research, they gained a better understanding of how chemicals and pollutions affected their bodies and their community's health. And so it became much more of a political act as it shifted from a more isolated and disconnected perception to one that is now more connected to a broader understanding of environmentalism. And so throughout that process of like learning and hosting different activities, members of the collective connected the issue of sickness in the community to their territory and its devastation. Uh, and so a lot of women in the collective are also mothers and so they're caregivers. And so they want their children and their family to eat healthy and live in a safe environment. Uh, and that is then also, that is like achieved through caregiving of the land. And so that's how you get like a very integrated view of caregiving both at home uh, and on the land. And so land defense is very connected. So Leila? In your report, uh, one of the, you know, big things that is a part of this particular research and how the Hero Ben uh, research project was able to, you know, provide such an amazing initiative was the creation or the producing of the community action and learning centers. And I just, you know, for those who are uninclined or unfamiliar, could you like tell us a little bit of like what those uh, centers are and how can these be replicated in other areas? Yeah, um, these are centers that were initially piloted by uh, an organization called CARE, you know, CARE Nepal. And um, they're based on Paulo Ferreira's pedagogical approach. Paulo Ferreira is a Brazilian educator. So, uh, and, and he's an innovator as well. And so it's very interesting to see how they translated his ideas into um, actionable community-based uh, intervention. And uh, these centers act like forums where members of the community, especially targeted at, you know, poor, vulnerable, socially excluded members, they come together and they learn about their rights. They discuss their challenges and they learn how to become empowered to address them. They're really a tailored approach for each community. And it's community-based, it's community-run, 
it's community sustained with the support of obviously the implementers and the local and federal governments. And so we've seen people, we've like we've heard directly from uh, some members in the community who were facilitators and who were part of the group, the groups that uh, went through the class throughout the 10 years. Some of them went from, uh, just, I remember this uh, particular um, women, young lady, and uh, I think she she told us that when she first started going to the class, she couldn't even introduce herself, like her name properly, or like talk about herself properly. And now she's an elected mon- member in the uh, local uh, government. In both reports, the issue of government inaction and the struggle of community participation um, emerged. How do these you know, factors affect the implementation of sustainable development in your communities? Yeah, so like one of the issues that were fi- that was faced by a lot of the collectives uh, was just like recruiting new participants and getting like a lot of community, uh, like a high community engagement. Um, and one of the root causes of this was just a lack of public awareness. Um, not everyone is necessarily aware of how, um, of, like the environmental devastation that has taken place uh, in the region and of the impacts on health. Um, like, for example, like connection between like the river's contamination and the surrounding communities, like health conditions. And so it's not always understood that sickness can be linked to environmental pollution. And so uh, people aren't necessarily super motivated to get involved because they don't necessarily understand that connection. Um, there's also just a big part. It's, it's just that community members are sick and so they can't necessarily participate as much as they would want to in activities or in workshops. Uh, and that obviously like affects the implementation of these initiatives. Um, so one of the examples like for the Water Treatment Collective, their first activity was just to take some time and to learn what they had lost uh, to contamination, such as clean water. And it's only after that they had spent some time really understanding what they had lost uh, that they decided to take action and really start uh, treating water um, with other community members. Uh, and then relating to government in action, um, they really so government in action seemed to contribute to the problem of land degradation. Um, as they provide kind of inefficient water treatments. Uh, so, for example, there's two main wastewater plants in the area uh, that cleanse the water, but they, it only cleansed it of organic compounds, and it wouldn't cleanse it of industrial pollutants such as heavy metals. Um, and so that really hinders the collective's actions because if they can't go to government for support, that means they have to go to external partners or like find different organizations that can help support them in their actions. Uh, so, for example, like they... Some of the collectives were partnering with ITESOs, like academic institutions, or with private foundations uh, to get the funding necessary. Yeah, um, I think government involvement and participation or, you know, on the opposite end, uh, lack of action is is incredibly um, one of the most important factors uh, for the success or failure. And when we say success and failure, we really can't really define what success is for um, long-term projects, especially climate-related. But uh, I think one of the factors that we saw that helped a lot of uh, the class succeed is the Nepalese government uh, policies that mandate the inclusion of women and um, the benefits for marginalized groups. Uh, So there are guidelines that dictate that 50% of the community uh, forest user groups leadership committees should be done by women. And and so uh, these policies being there and the community action learning centers being also present to uh, provide the uh, training to help uh, these marginalized uh, members to become uh, part of the part of this quota is important. On on the flip side, um, when local governments are not as active or not part included or given resources by uh, the big implementers, international groups, or, or even local organizations. This is what we saw being one of the main drivers for the dismantling of some of the, of the clocks that we uh, studied. And so um, developing networks and uh, collaboration with the government is very important. And uh, it's an early indicator of whether a project would succeed and implementation would succeed or not. And um, there has to be some sort of way of, of really empowering the local governments, particularly because when we look at sustainability, 
in in the projects that we saw, every I think virtually we conducted twenty nine interviews, and I think in around twenty seven of them, answering the question of what would help the, your project or your uh, the benefit that you receive from whatever implementation that we talked about to succeed. I think all the participants said the participation of the local government, which is you know very significant at least in, in, in the context that we study. So now that you guys have completed your research and have now put together this report, what is the one thing that you hope people will take away from the report? I think one takeaway that uh, I really hope our research uh, sort of help highlights is just the critical uh, role of community involvement and uh, empowerment in sustainable development initiatives. Um, as I talked about, the success of the CLACs in improving governance, capacity building, and promoted, promoting uh, climate, um, bio, climate change uh, adaptation and biodiversity um, has been you know, proven, at least to a great extent. Um, there's still issues surrounding scalability. And so for in terms of like future research directions, I think looking into how community-led models can be adapted and scaled in different socioeconomic and cultural contexts would be valuable. I completely agree. Um, I think just like for, for our project, uh, like the main takeaway would just be that, you know, like the success of these initiatives, which had been defined, which like success has been defined in this context as just like the continued survival of the three collectives, despite the obstacles they face. You know, you don't want to look at it in very like quantitative metrics like the community members feel that they're successful because they're still there and they're still fighting and they're still doing like land defense um, but all those successes are made possible thanks to the social fabric of the communities both of our research are on similar problematics um, but it was very different ways on how to how people have decided to approach them and so it was mm -hmm. super interesting to hear about it 100 percent. and i think uh even within reach i think we would benefit a lot from doing a uh, cross review of all the research that we've done, taking things in common, in common, and and looking to how to bring this knowledge back to the communities that we visited, and that's I think the next step that we are all engaged in now that our, our research is published. I just want to say thank you, Layla and Martha, for your time today. I, I've learned so much about your research, but also just the amazing insights that you were able to glean for the past couple of months and just piecing it together. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank Kat. you. Great talking to you, Marco. You can find both of their newly published reports on our website at reachalliance.org and make sure to follow us online as we will be posting more insights from both reports next week.